I always saw the Narns as being top-notch warriors, uh, but what I didn't really see in them, which Andreas brought, was a certain elegance, a certain style. Um, to see someone in all this makeup being very elegant suddenly brought whole new possibilities to bear. And it, it showed in the big ways and in the small ways. When I created the character, actually the first time I created it was, it was Jackar, J-A-C-K-A-R-R. I, I figured that doesn't look right. I made a G apostrophe K A R Jakar. And at one point I was um, talking to um, Andreas and he was rehearsing and he introduced himself as Jakar. And I pull him off to the side and I said, Jakar? He said, I've decided I'm French. And I just started laughing. I said, you know what? From now on, it's Jakar. And we kept it. Uh, but again, it was that sense of elegance, even in his own name and how he approached it, and his manners and the refinement that he brought to it. Uh, as a writer, you start off with the hole that you have to fill with the character. He's a warrior. He's a this. He's a that. And I, all I had was he's a warrior. Uh, but Andreas brought to him that, that elegance, that refinement, uh, so that when you came into his quarters for a meeting and before he leaves his bedroom, five ladies leave first, you accept it because it's it's Jakar, or Jakar, and uh, that, that, you live and die for those kind of moments. Andreas, it was a, a marvel to me. He created this character of Jakar, a Narn. What is a Narn? Well, you could have said and looked at him and said he's a large reptilian character with spots and beady red eyes and very eloquent, but massive, this big body that he had. Andreas felt very at home as Jakar. I don't think he really wanted anybody to see him. That's where he really felt alive. He loved getting in that makeup. I rarely saw him out of it, to tell you the truth. And in the heat of the summer in uh, Sun Valley there in California, uh, he'd, love, he'd sit right out in the shade of my dressing trailer, because it was nearest the back door, and sit in the shade of that. It'd be 115 out. And he'd just smoke his cigarettes and chat and chat. And he, I mean, he's in tons of uh, prosthetic makeup and, and stuff. He was so comfortable in that. <laughs> he never would leave it. I swear to God, he'd take it home and stay in costume. I'd written this scene where um, Jakar and uh, Londo are trapped in an elevator. And the, the, the trope in television is, is that they must work together now to stay alive. And I want to turn that trope upside down where essentially Jakara says, I'm not going to help you. Yes, I will die if we don't work together, but I get to see you die, and I'm okay with that. And it was written in a very straightforward fashion. When I did, went to shoot that scene in the elevator, I was walking through stage A, and I yeah, called action, and I stopped, which is what you have to do as a protocol on the set, you stop moving. And I began to hear this laughter. What scene are they shooting where there's Jakar is laughing like an insane person? They called cut that went up. And Dreas looking very sheepish. He said, uh, Joe, I I decided to do this whole scene with, with Lando where I'm laughing hysterically. It wasn't written that way. But him being a liberated warrior, seeing that he could finally see his enemy die, even though he was gonna die, would be the funniest thing in the world. And let me show you what I'm I'm doing. And I did it again, and tears were raining down my face. It was so wonderfully funny. And in the end, they all kind of looked at me, all crew, like they'd been caught you know, after school smoking. And they said, is that okay? I said, it's wonderful. And walked away. That's what Andreas brought. He always came at the material from a right angle. And when he did so, he elevated whatever I wrote or anybody else wrote to a whole new level of craft and storytelling. Uh, and that is so rare to have. I'll tell you. Um, as much as the kindness made me feel like one of the family, Andreas did something on my first episode. Um, it was a huge scene with all of us in Sheridan's office, and we, they were setting up some lights. And I, you know, I'd been on my feet all day. It was my first day. I hadn't slept much the night before. I was excited. And I was walking over to sit down in the only available seat just to rest for a second. And, and Andreas <laughs> ran over and took it first. <laughs> <Bless him. laughs> and, 
and Peter, uh, uh, Londo, Peter, goes, dude, what are you doing? She's the new kid. And he goes like, hell no, she's one of the family now. I take any of your seats, I'm going to take hers too. And that, that teasing probably made me feel even more at home than all the kind gestures. Because you, you don't tease somebody you don't like. I have a picture. I'm very fond of, of my 11-year-old son as this little chubby baby in the arms of Jakar. And he's looking down at him really sweetly. <laughs> Mikey is, I don't know how many months old he was. He was a little Gerber baby. I mean, he was just chunks, little crying away there. But it wasn't because he was afraid of Andreas, because he wasn't. He was mesmerized looking up into, into those red eyes. And, and uh, Andreas is wonderful wonderful voice deep voice and uh, it was because he was hungry for mommy it was it was food time <laughs> but uh, I treasure that picture I treasure all of this stuff there are people in your life who show you how to live there are people in your life who show you how to die and Andrea showed me how to die properly and that was a transformational experience for me I had this theory that the more important and intimate the emotion, the fewer words are required to express it. Uh, for instance, in dating, um, will you go out with me? Six words. Um, I think I care for you. Five words. Um, you matter to me. Four words. I love you. Three words. Marry me. Two words. Well, what's left? What's the one most important and intimate word you can ever say to somebody? It's goodbye. And I think of Andreas, I think of goodbye, and how important that was for me. I had no idea how we were going to approach the subject matter of two of our fellows, our members of the cast that are no longer with us. And I wonder how that was going to be treated. And I think it's done wonderfully in this. I, I'm very proud that I get to kind of refer to them, but not as though they're dead, because their characters will never die. Mm -hmm. They're just beyond the rim. And that's always been Babylon 5 E's for uh, uh, a myriad of things has gone on, we may never see them again, but we know they're out there somewhere, exploring, spiritually, physically, everything. I had a line where um, Sheridan asks me um, who's going to be there, and I said May Garibaldi might come, but I don't know, I haven't heard back from him in a while. And he says, what about, what about Stephen? And, and I say, haven't you heard? And the line is written, um, He's gone exploring beyond the rim, and I, I couldn't get through it. And, uh, Andreas Katsoulis and Richard Biggs were two wonderful gentlemen. They were great fun, uh, terrific actors, really created some very wonderful characters. Richard, who played our Dr. Stephen Franklin, wonderfully sensitive man, a party animal, but brought so much to every scene. He used to go down at conventions <clears throat> uh, and dance on tables, literally, at midnight with bands. Uh, and he would carry on and just be absolutely nonstop. Uh, and no one ever had a bad word to say about Richard. When he, we had the uh, <clears throat> funeral, everyone showed up. Um, every family, every studio, every show has its alliances and its factions and its feuds. Uh, this person likes that person, doesn't like that person over there. This person hates that person over there. Everyone liked Richard. Everyone liked Rick. Um, and even people who didn't much like each other, when the time of the funeral came, put aside everything else for Rick, as he would have wanted that. Richard was kind of the, of the human population of Babylon 5. Stephen Franklin was kind of our conscience. He was the doctor. I was the warrior diplomat, whatever. Stephen Franklin was our doctor, our healer, 
refused to fight, even though he did when he was put up against the wall. He handled himself very well. <laughs> One stuntman will attest to that. It knocked him cold. <laughs> but that was, oops, a little too close. But he played that part with such passion. A very passionate man. He, it really rattled all of us. It really affected all of us. We had a wonderful memorial for him up in Topanga Canyon at the um, Will Gear Theatrical Botanica Gardens. So many people showed up to say good things. That's a testament to you when you're gone. How many people show up to tell stories about you? One of my fondest memories of Rick Biggs, and I thought it was very, again, very, very interesting that Joe wrote it this way, is in River of Souls, when Lockley is, is going toward the light and facing death, the character who appears to her is really one of the lost souls, but he appears to her in the form of Dr. Franklin. And, he, and the reason that he's taken that form, and these are Dr. Franklin's lines, is he says, I'm appearing to you as someone that you trust and love so I can reach you. And um, again, very prophetic. When we lost Richard, I went to the, uh, the funeral with everyone else from the show. And I knew that the show mattered to him. I didn't know quite the extent to which it did matter, however, until the end. As it turned out, um, we got in line to pass by the casket. I ended up being the last person in line, and his wife was there, as well as his father and his like, three or four sisters. Uh, he was the only boy in, in a family of, of, of girls. And I met the wife once or twice, but I wasn't sure if she didn't recognize who I was. Um, and I never met the family. And as you come up to them to pass on your regards, I thought, what, what should I say? And you know, should I introduce myself? And I'm not going to introduce myself because it's not who I am. It's saying to them, you know, I'm sorry for your loss and all the rest of it. And I get up there and the wife sees me in line and starts crying and turns to her father-in-law, Richard's father, and you know, just says, it's Joe. She didn't say it's Joe Straczynski, she didn't say it's the producer, it's Joe. And I found out at that moment how much the role mattered to him, how much he talked about it. And it was his favorite role of all time. That it was the one time when his being black or African American was never an issue. It was never brought up. It was just him as a person. And, and we talked and we hugged and we cried. And I realized how much the role mattered to him. And walked away a very different person.